On the eve of the new millennium, international terrorism, civil and economic chaos, and the growing availability of weapons of mass destruction present an endless array of threats that the world's national security concerns could not have predicted even as recently as the end of the Cold War. One unit experienced in unconventional special operations missions is the U.S. Navy SEALs, a classified maritime special operations unit trained to respond to conflicts around the globe. Today's threats to world peace have reinforced the demand for a rapid, smaller military response to situations where a full-scale military intervention is not practical. These situations are known as conflicts other than war. For the first time, cameras were allowed into the secretive world of the U.S. Navy SEAL teams. Despite restrictions on filming certain classified subjects, the events pictured here are actual training and military operations never before seen by the public. With a muster of less than 2,500 men, the U.S. Navy SEALs is the smallest American special operations combat force. Operational for over half a century as frogmen in oceans and rivers, they have evolved into a force able to use sea, air, or land to launch surprise assaults. The modern SEAL has earned a reputation as a well-trained, unconventional commando force. The thread that runs from the Vietnam War through the Gulf conflict is conflict. That's what it is, whether it's conflict in the 1800s, conflict in the 21st century. How does that individual deal with some of the uh, mind-numbing fear that they are going to encounter when they put themselves in harm's way? It doesn't matter that harm's way comes from a bow and arrow or harm's way is going to come from an in, in, inbound uh, TLAM or some other sort of missile. It's that basic conflict. Indecisiveness uh, kills more men in combat than anything else. Aggressiveness, my God, by the nature of what we do, if you're not aggressive, I mean, you have a gun, you're going out there to uh, wreak a little havoc, so it'd probably be very important that you be aggressive. Attitude is everything. It is said that no clan ever survives first contact with the enemy. In battle, a soldier's conscious mind shuts down as instinct and training take over. In the first confusing seconds of combat, disciplined reaction to the suddenness of battle will decide who lives and who dies. This SEAL squad is practicing a coordinated leapfrog movement using live ammunition. Their tactic, while basic in concept, becomes complex under live fire. In the stressful noise and confusion of moving and shooting in rough terrain, men can become separated or stunned into indecision. Even the most experienced veteran can forget simple procedures. In combat, this is called the fog of war.
survive as a unit, each man in a SEAL squad must know how to recover his senses and adapt to a chaotic situation. This squad has regrouped into a full muster to maximize their firepower before breaking contact with the enemy and making their escape. This is called finding the door. We are preparing men to go into harm's way and defend freedom. They operate in austere conditions with a small number of men in very demanding and highly classified missions. And in combat, there's winners and there's losers. The difference between combat and in sports is they bury the guy who comes in second place. Navy SEALs operate primarily in the ocean, a violent and unpredictable environment. Underwater operations require the ability to control fear. At night, in cold water, staying focused is key to survival. There are a lot of organizations who have a good reconnaissance capability. They can put four men into enemy territory and communicate back. And what makes us different from them? We get in the water regularly here, and that's the thing that sets us apart. You have a lot of people that do carry guns on land, that can do anything on land. But the minute you mix them with water, that's when you're going to get the fear factor up. You get underneath the ship at night, you can't see anything. If anything goes wrong underneath the ship, you have no air. I think that's when you start mixing things in is when you can't breathe and you're underwater. That's when you'll start having fear. I don't know who started the idea that SEALs uh, always want to get in the water. I know most SEALs I know, the last thing they want to do is get wet. But when your mission does include being in the water, that is our bread and butter, and and, uh, and that's what we do. I <laughs> went and cold, I, <laughs> I, I can't think of any frogman that really likes that. Usually the dives are uh, three hours long or two and a half hours long and turtle backs and all other stuff. You can be out there all night, but it's fun to watch newer people get under there who think, you know, it really sucks under there, especially if it's no moon and no lights. You know, then it gets, gets kind of dark and scary. In a job where attention to detail is a matter of life and death, the violent and cold-blooded nature of the sea mirrors the SEAL doctrine for making war. The world is getting uh, more and more crowded. That's a fact. And as it becomes more and more crowded, more and more people, more and more friction. More and more friction is not going to be on the high end of the spectrum, in my opinion. It's going to be on the low end. And the low end is our business. You can see the movement as far as the team's going from not only guerrilla warfare, going into, I don't want to say so much of a conventional warfare, but more of an urban warfare. Urban warfare is the new battleground for low intensity conflicts. Large platoon maneuvers are a different approach for SEAL teams used to operating in squads of eight men or less. Mock urban settings like this one allow 16 and 18 man SEAL platoons to practice new tactics in settings far different from the jungles of Vietnam or the deserts of the Gulf War. Urban warfare is definitely the wave of the future. With most military actions that we've been involved in, uh, an urban environment has been involved uh, to some degree. So you have to learn how to move around those type of areas. Nowadays, uh, with terrorism, and a lot of the conflicts taking place right in the cities themselves. Training has gotten more technical. There's new equipment out there. And just because you have it as the good guys, nothing stating the bad guys don't have it. So training has become more intense. It's also gotten to the point where we're working in probably a little bit bigger units. A host of security issues every bit as dangerous as the nuclear peril of the Cold War faces the world today. America and its democratic allies may have slain the Soviet nuclear dragon, but in many ways, the dragon was easier to track and control than the jungle of terrorist snakes that took its place. Uh, there are several threats. 
We have uh, a terrorist threat, as you know, from the bombing of our embassy in Kenya. We have several disputes going on right now, one in Ethiopia and Eritrea. Obviously, we have a threat from Iran. We all know about uh, Saddam in Iraq, and we're not uh, paranoid when we say there are areas that are tough and we have hostilities. It's a violent, dynamic area, and you've got to be well-versed and have a sensitivity to the factions over there and understand that uh, these people don't play games. I should note that some of these terror groups represent countries, but some of them are non-state actors that are carrying out their own individual agendas. And in many ways, they represent the most daunting transnational threat because it's hard to pin them down. You know, we live in a bad neighborhood, and we have got to be prepared to execute U.S. national policies and objectives every day. We deploy with live ammunition. I mentioned Ethiopia and Eritrea. Right now, it's a stalemate. They could break out in war at any time. There may be U.S. civilians in there. We may have to help out and assist. That's just one example. These smaller geopolitical war zones are battlefields where enforcing the peace has become as deadly as fighting a war. Normally when SEALs go in harm's way, we go in little bitty bunches, okay? One man's got to eliminate a lot of people in a very short period of time. Combine the whole squad doing that, giving no quarter. That's how you survive. That's how you stay alive in our business. U.S. Navy SEALs constantly train for war in every part of the world. Knowledge of the terrain they will operate in helps them anticipate situations they may encounter. This is vital to a SEAL platoon's success. They are a force that relies on versatility and planning, as well as discipline and firepower. This is the M14 battle rifle. It's chambered for the 762 by 51 NATO cartridge. This is not a puny M16. This is a full-size 30 caliber battle rifle employed by the Navy SEAL teams. Other services use this weapon as a sniper rifle, and we use it that way too. But we also carry it on an individual basis out in the field. This is a very robust rifle, very accurate out to long ranges, beyond 800 yards. If you have to shoot men that are behind emplacements, cover, this is the rifle you want to do it with. It penetrates the brush. It goes through bunkers. It goes through branches, through walls, through automobile sheet metal and glass. It also works extremely well in adverse conditions, Arctic conditions. The SEALs support conventional main force efforts by observing and reporting enemy troop movements creating diversions, or directly attacking targets. But life in the field is harsh and monotonous. Foxtrot Bravo, this is Alpha Charlie. Received your message. We should be extracting in about two hours. In areas of Norway and Alaska, SEALs train in severe temperatures that would paralyze a larger conventional force. 
the physical and psychological demands for waging war in extreme climate conditions are brutal. This effort requires an emotional endurance beyond the ordinary. In an underwater attack, surprise is essential. A small seal element maintains its advantage only if it remains undetected. Despite its vulnerability during launch, this type of operation has proved to be a highly successful seal tactic. Having some of those special capabilities vested in a small force, you have the opportunity to take and do the term du jour has been surgical operations. You have a uh, burgeoning crisis, you can potentially defuse that with one short, quick, perhaps rapid action. During the Cold War, you had Navy SEALs doing an awful lot of underwater operations around Russian harbors, monitoring Soviet ships. You had Navy SEALs during the Central American War tasked to the CIA that were involved in uh, the mining of Nicaraguan harbors. This was all part of the maritime strategy. Operating in water provides the SEALs an invisible means of attack. However, launching men and equipment from the submarine, usually in dark and cold water, poses serious hazards for even the best trained frogmen. Locking out of a submarine, going to the surface and then certain from over the horizon, for example, in inclement weather, sea state, large surf, bad surf going into the target. That is where it gets real, real, real iffy. I'll tell you, I've been caught in some real, real bad surf. And that sure made a believer out of me. And in the dark of night, and you're all disoriented, you're getting beat to death, you're loaded down with gear. Uh, it can be uh, real taxing. Of course, when you look over at your teammate, you know he's suffering too. And most of the things we do is to maintain the respect of our counterparts and our buddies in the platoon. When you think you're going to failure and you'd sure like to quit, you just look over at uh, Jim and you go, he can hack it, I can, and I'm not gonna let him down. So you carry on, you carry on. Traveling over water remains the most effective way to move a SEAL platoon in and out of a target area. The special boat squadrons can bring SEALs into the beach or remain over the horizon out of sight, ready to insert or extract them on a moment's notice. I think one thing we've always learned in, in special operations, you're only as good as the people that get you in and get you out. Anytime water's involved, be it the sea or riverine operations, any coastline, that's primarily where I look to the SEALs and their expertise, along with their special boat units. They have a unique capability in that they have their own infiltration and exfiltration craft. Traditionally, the special boat squadrons were often ignored in the Navy's emphasis on organizing and training the higher profile SEAL teams. However, this has changed with the recognition that boat units give the SEALs an advantage no other special operations group has, a shallow water capability to deliver men to inland waterways quickly and quietly. Traveling for hours over water will fatigue even the best conditioned crew and SEAL operators. This is the Mark V. It is 85 feet in length with a top speed over 55 miles per hour. It was designed for speed and low radar signature. With an extended operating range and a degree of comfort and stability, it has the nautical range, speed, and maneuverability SEAL teams require for their special operations. Transferring men and equipment in the open sea has always been difficult. When surface conditions are rough, problems multiply. Mark Vs are specially designed to launch and recover a SEAL squad in their combat rubber raiding craft while underway. Its hull design incorporates a sloping ramp on the stern, allowing it to directly recover the SEALs in one movement. Originally designed as a life raft, 
The combat rubber raiding craft is a 15-foot, 265-pound raft that carries four combat-ready seals and travels at up to 20 knots. A 55-horsepower outboard engine and a 65-mile range provide an over-the-horizon insertion and extraction capability. Although over-the-horizon missions remain a tactical option, ocean and weather conditions can pose a dangerous risk. The speed, range, and shallow draft of the Mark V allow it to come in close to shore, launch or recover their sealed cargo, and get out before they can be intercepted. Armed with four weapon stations, it can mount 50 caliber machine guns, Mark 19 grenade launchers, and smaller M60 machine guns. Inside the covered cabin, three men navigate and engineer the craft while underway. Steering is done using computerized hand toggles. Using water jet propulsion for thrust instead of propellers, this all-purpose boat carries a crew of six and seating for an entire SEAL platoon. Specially designed seats have a shoulder harness to secure the passenger's ride in heavy seas. Equipped with radar, sonar, and GPS systems, the Mark V is an efficient and dependable way to move SEALs and their equipment. In an age of intercontinental missiles, remote control weapons, and cyberspace, obtaining accurate intelligence is a key ingredient to the security of most nations. One of the biggest activities that our special operators are involved in is counter-drug operations. This is a major activity for the SEALs as well. The Navy SEALs are also out there working in the regions supported by the special boat units as well as the patrol coastals, which are really not craft but ship. It's a 171-foot ship that is now a favorite of those law enforcement agencies that are involved in counter-drug operations so that you typically see Navy SEALs supporting the work of the patrol coastals in the Caribbean and, uh, of course, they're also in the Persian Gulf. Powerful narco-terrorist organizations have created political instability in their own countries and radically altered the perception of what constitutes a threat to U.S. national interests. Special boat squadrons deploy throughout the world and play a major role in the supporting and training of anti-drug forces in Central and South America. The Hurricane-class coastal patrol craft is the first designed for Navy special warfare use. With two 25-millimeter guns, Stinger anti-aircraft missiles, and other weapons, it carries enough firepower for enforcing counter-drug operations along coastal waters. A range of 2,000 miles and a cruising speed of 12 knots makes its primary tasks coastal patrol and supporting SEAL units. Too large to land SEALs directly on shore, the ship has room for one SEAL squad, not an entire platoon. Nevertheless, its stability in rough seas makes it well suited for offshore cruising. Navy SEALs and special boat units are training other nations to fight a counter-drug war in the Amazon river basins of South America. For secret intelligence operations with no clear battle lines, SEALs and the special boat units have developed into an effective independent riverine counter-drug force. This is one of the missions of the so-called Groundwater Navy. Right now, the world situation is changing, and our relationship with the third world is evolving one of the things that, that we do as Naval Special Warfare Forces is represent the military with small people with, that don't leave a big footprint. So we're not really doing anything different to adjust to the new world order. I think that the new world order is making, uh, making us a more valuable resource than we were before because the focus is more on the things that we're trained to do. We probably will not fight another war like Desert Storm again. I think 
a good bit of the third world uh, learned, particularly in the Middle East, was that it's not a good idea to launch a conventional war against the United States, because uh, that's our bread and butter type of operation. So we'll probably see a lot more smaller type of actions. It may not be amphibious work, it may be riverine operations. The next wars may be in Latin America and Central America uh, on the river stopping drug traffic, and they may have to adopt to that. The United States is attempting to strategically reprioritize its military and national intelligence focus as a response to the wave of religious, state, and criminal terrorism throughout the world. The kinds of terrorist groups that we're seeing emerge today, they are engaged in criminal activity, but they are also engaged in a, in a kind of asymmetrical warfare against American interests. Uh, knowing full well, particularly those that represent rogue states, that they can't confront us in a conventional sense. They're looking for ways to get at our people in unconventional ways. And that's why special operations forces, particularly the Navy SEALs, are adept and available for that kind of un unconventional threat. Counter drug operations have become an important special operations mission throughout South America. Criminal groups inside Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia routinely smuggle hundreds of tons of cocaine a year to the United States. As we operate today and as, as we prepare for the future, as, as boundaries melt and we're dealing more and more with transnational threats, I think that increasingly special operations forces will be operating in what I would call the seam between war and crime. Yes, it's a combat sort of thing. Yes, we could obviously bring military capabilities to bear on the problem, but do we as a country want to declare war with the military might that we have on what is, uh, what is perceived at this point in time as a civilian problem. As soon as you start to interject a military solution on a civilian situation, you raise all kinds of issues that we have not yet dealt with. We need to be careful before we decide to go in that direction. Over two-thirds of the world's population and economic infrastructure is located within 300 miles of the coastline. Using small teams of boats and men, riverine warfare is a potential battleground for clandestine SEAL-type operations. However, the political risks are many, the results unpredictable. The buzzword is low-intensity conflicts, uh, or conflicts other than war. These are wars that are short of actual shooting battles, where you want to send a small, deniable group in to affect some type of outcome. There's a big debate within the Pentagon over this, because the view there, and it was expressed by Colin Powell, the former Joint Chiefs of Staff, is that if the conflict was not worth enough to go in openly, then it may not be worth enough to go in covertly. And that small, low-intensity conflicts become high-intensity ones very, very quickly. Potential SEAL missions have always involved political risk. Secrecy of movement is vital. Through constant training, SEALs and special boat units work to perfect insertion and extraction techniques, waiting for a call that may never come. You need to take an overview of what we're trying to accomplish in the counter-drug situation. Do we want to interdict this five or ten kilos of coke? Do we want to interdict those couple of hundred pounds of marijuana? What's, what's the real role? My answer to that, those first couple of questions is probably not. We need to get at the source and we need to get at the people who are organizing and who are paying the people to grow the marijuana and process the coke. If there's an example to be made and somebody wants to use the best forces that are available, again, we have to go to a much higher level uh, that's going to authorize the use of American military in that role. The SEAL reputation for undertaking risky missions can be a double-edged sword. Their tactics of sabotage and hit-and-run ambush are not always accepted as the American way to do battle. You go in and neutralize the target. That's the accepted politically correct word or terminology to, to use in this day and age. Well, when you say that, everybody knows what we're going to do. 
And to neutralize that target, you have in fact killed everybody within sight of hearing. Hotel 5, Hotel 5, this is Sierra 1. Roger, Hotel 5, Sierra 1. Request cold extract, primary insert point. I'll copy, over. We do train a lot, and uh, the day does kind of drag out sometimes, and, and training does get kind of boring once you've done it over and over and over the same thing, but it's all about, you know, that, that pipe dream. It's all about waiting to go. And if you're lucky enough to be there when your number gets called, well, good on you. And that's what everybody's waiting for. Everybody here wants to do the same thing. Everybody here looks forward to going to combat. And that's the kind of people that I want to be around, and that's the kind of people that seals off. Despite the volley of covering fire, SEALs and special boat units are vulnerable as soon as they make contact with the enemy. Their small size and remote areas of operation usually leave them out of range of friendly fire support. The weapons they carry are all they have to defend themselves. It's very difficult to put what we do in a context that somebody who doesn't do it will understand. The context we do those things in is in defense of this country, in defense of this democracy. We do it at the request, only at the request and direction of the civilian leadership. Call that a commercial if you will. All special operations forces train to beat the odds by reducing warfare to its simplest level. SEAL strategy for victory is based on the principles of an uncomplicated plan and keeping movements concealed. To gain speed on target, full-scale dress rehearsals are conducted whenever possible. To put yourself at risk unnecessarily is not what we're looking for. We're not looking for that guy at all because he jeopardizes everyone. We want that professional, very focused individual that'll go in harm's way in a heartbeat. If you weren't, you'd be like any other organization where it's just too bad. You know, okay, I lost, it's too bad. That's no way to be, you'll, you'll never win that way. And when you're trying to win, I mean, you're winning with your life sometimes. One naval special warfare mission that requires diplomacy as much as force of arms is called Foreign Internal Defense, or FID. 
This involves a SEAL or special boat unit interacting with a foreign country's military counterpart. Many times, this may be the first occasion soldiers from either side have experienced the other nation's culture. Being able to speak and communicate with your foreign counterpart is extremely important. Right up front, it lets them know that uh, you're concerned and you care about the training that you're doing with them and you take it very seriously, even if you're making an effort to uh, speak the language. All special forces have FID as one of their primary jobs. Despite some criticism that FID training creates the potential for abuse by the host countries, low-level military contacts are designed to reinforce American influence and create solid connections between the military forces. Chileans are really great guys. They've got a great sense of humor. They want to uh, interact with us. It's evident in just about everything they do. They're very receptive to any ideas we have. They're very eager to learn. They're very quick. They're, they're sharp guys, and, and they're tough. All right, here you go. Okay. La, la punta anterior. Sí. Uh, un poquito uh, abajo. Dos clics. Uh, dos uh, cliques o media uh, reverta. Hacia la derecha. Yeah, uh, yeah. arriba. Uh, esté bien. OK. OK, dos cliques. Dos cliques a la derecha. Sí. Despite the monotony that inevitably comes from the relentless training schedule they follow, SEALs never stray far from their ultimate hope, to be called upon to go to war. Well, hell yeah. Think about it all the time. I mean, this isn't G.I. Jane. This is the real deal. We, we're here to fight. We come down here to train these guys and to get a little bit more of, of training for ourselves. But the bottom line is it's all about combat. It's all about going. It's like being on a football team that, uh, you know, you get to train and train and never get to play. So when the big game comes up, you know, as, as horrible as that may sound, you, you still want to play in the game. Most weapons used by a SEAL platoon are modified to fit personal requirements for weight and dependability. The M60 is normally a crew-served weapon, but in a SEAL platoon, it is carried by one man. The platoon life of the M60 gunner is burdened by the extra 35 to 45 pounds of weapon and ammunition he must carry. Well, basically, 60 gunners are there to lay down the law. A lot of platoons, uh, they give the 60s to the new guys, which I don't completely agree with, because it takes a lot more experience and time to be able to carry that gun and move with a rifleman at the same pace and not grow tired and not lag behind, because then you're just a hindrance. I did five platoons carrying an M60, and it's, it's not fun. The platoon can only move as fast as its slowest man. Your slowest man is always your 60 gunner, period. And people are like, come on, dude, let's move, all right? You know, they're mad at you. It takes you longer to get up a cliff, takes you longer to get across the river. But when you start rocking and rolling out there, they love you. And the other guys, they know that there's a wall of lead out there, and there's that sound that keeps the enemy's heads down, and they can concentrate on picking the guys off. That 60, it's a, it's a sweet sound. Run! Run! Yeah, always the first thing on my mind is to lay down as much lead as I can as quick as possible. I like to just destroy as much stuff as I can in the least amount of time. That way it gives everybody else enough time to get back. Run! The preparation for war never stops for any SEAL platoon. After training with the Chilean Special Forces all day, this platoon moves directly into a live fire immediate action drill. Inside the action, the speed and intensity of eight men running and shooting in rough terrain is difficult to comprehend by anyone who has not experienced it. When you're actually in a contact drill, it seems like it's going pretty fast because you, you have a lot of things going on trying to find out uh, where your contact's coming from, uh, what you can do about it, what kind of terrain you have to move around, and worrying about what kind of ammunition you can throw down, shooting, grenades, your rockets, whatever you can get out there. Basically just to get out of the situation and uh, carry on with your mission.
During the contact drill, there's a lot of things that happen very quickly. That's why it's uh, very important to continue to maintain that communication and uh, safety. Looking right and left down the, the line of fire, watching behind as the drill goes down. It's real important that everyone maintains verbal and eye communication throughout the, the entire execution because you take a look afterwards at a video and it'll look like you're moving pretty slow. But uh, during the execution of the actual movement, it, everything uh, happens pretty quickly. If SEALs lose unit cohesion under an attack, they lose their strongest asset, discipline and control. Every SEAL platoon practices certain procedures, or SOPs, designed to help them recover should they lose unity during a fight. Let's go, let's go! When you're in a combat role, things are in the soup. Uh, things are happening pretty quick. The decision-making process, uh, you, you usually will have about a second, second and a half maybe to make a decision to move on. And a person that cannot do that, he doesn't have much of a chance for survival and the men that are looking to him for that decisiveness, that leadership, they don't have much of a chance either. You're gonna drop the ball a lot of times because there's a lot of things you can't predict. So everybody knows if everything goes wrong, they can get back in the groove. They know exactly at what point they're gonna have to pick it back up again. It's like a dance step. You know that on the third step, you should be stepping back and uh, you, you gotta get back in that groove. It is often difficult for the civilian to understand why SEALs train under harsh and dangerous live fire conditions. The concern pushing every SEAL platoon is the desire to be ready, if called upon, to go to war. SEALs take such risks in peacetime with the belief that the degree of difficulty and the effort of training is the key to survival in combat. We train like we fight. You know, you'll come back, go out, do some uh, immediate action drills in the daytime, shoot, come back, grab a bite to eat if you have time to do it, and, uh, carry on your next mission. You might be going out, getting into boats, doing it over the beach, but uh, that's your job. That's what we train for, and it's no problem doing it today because you might have to do it in the war tomorrow. SEAL Special Operations, supported by the U.S. government, often require clandestine tactics. The strict rules of engagement for these missions and the complexities they pose for the troops involved are the key to understanding the political difficulties inherent in low-intensity conflicts. Certainly it is one of perspective. Doctrinal definitions of high-intensity, mid-intensity, and low-intensity on the battlefield but I would submit to you, if you're the soldier, sailor, airman, marine in the foxhole and they're shooting at you, it is high intensity. The uh, difference today, of course, are these small pockets of terrorism that exist uh, in these little enclaves don't warrant a full frontal assault, if you will, of all the national resources in our arsenal. So therefore, we commit small, highly trained units with exacting skills. The operations tend to be more precise, more precision oriented. U.S. Navy SEALs operate on orders frequently shaped by political military considerations at the highest level. As a result, they are often propelled into the gray area between diplomacy and covert operations. For SEALs, the only concern is maintaining their edge, keeping one foot in the water and one foot on the beach. Some of the more flamboyant ones will say that you know, our job is to kill people and break things. And if you have them spending their time painting churches rather than training to do what they're really uh, trained to do, then they probably won't be as good at what they're, they should be doing, <laughs> killing people and breaking things. But you know, that is the, the core of what, what being a SEAL is. Not an irresponsible slaughtering people or uh, breaking things that, uh, because you like to see things blow up, but doing this discipline in carrying out the military and foreign policy of the United States, doing what the president wants them to do. The thing that people like about what SEALs offer is also the thing that in its other manifestations they don't like, and that is that creativity. 
that the independence that the junior people will show in uh, how to deal with a problem. Where on the one hand, we are given a lot of credit for being creative and having a, a, a special abilities, that independence also, uh, some people will, will see that as these guys are loose cannons. We are very well disciplined, uh, though it expresses itself in a different way than it does in the Marine Corps or in the Army. That individuality sometimes uh, causes them to overamp in the civilian sector, but you got a racehorse here. You got a, a thoroughbred, if you will. And they require a little different handling. You know, you got to rein them in a little bit more. But we don't want to rein them in so much, we take that aggressiveness out of them. Online! Online! The way I put it to them is gentlemen, you can be as aggressive as you want to as long as you maintain it at a professional level. So when you get out in the civilian sector, party as hard as you want. You know, they play hard, we got to party hard. Well, that's fine. You can party, party hard. I want you to do that at a professional level. As long as you do it at a professional level, you'll never have any problem with the old Master Chief. Most SEAL operators view the media with suspicion. In the age of information, there is an inherent uneasiness between SEALs and anyone they suspect might reveal their mission capabilities to the outside world. The best rumors started about SEAL Team have been started by people who were never in SEAL Team who tell people they are SEALs. Demo team in! The best stories that have ever come up are coming up from people who have never even met a SEAL, let alone uh, had anything to do with SEAL Team. Most of us just go along with it and laugh, you know, because, yeah, that's a good story. <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> the best way of putting it is we're not that good. It's just everybody else sucks. I've always thought that the American people probably know more about what we do than they should. From a military point of view, uh, <laughs> the civilian sector has no need to know because they're not trained in operational security, so they could give up a secret that could cause me to lose my life in some foreign land. Now, with the evil empire being gone now, they say, well, everything's kind of uh, not a problem anymore. Well, I, hey, if you believe that, I got some beachfront property in Arizona, I'd like to sell you to, at a good price. Time on target. Status. Yellow set. Ready to pull fuses? I got smoke. The SEAL is committed to precision small unit operations, launching on short notice and in the dark of night. Dedicated to his purpose and the other men in his platoon, the killing ground can be anywhere, under an enemy ship, behind enemy lines, inside a hotel room, an airliner, or American embassy. What SEALs do and where SEALs go on real world operations will remain classified invisible to the outside world and a ruthless surprise to their enemies. <laughs>